as you bless our time together, and provide us direction and help us to, as we study uh, what your word has revealed, that, uh, that we would come to a better understanding of who you are and, and what you've done for us. Thank you for this church and the body of believers you've put here. Just pray that you would continue to guide, bless, and direct us, and help us to be salt and light into this world for you. Thank you and praise you in Christ. So we are going to, to get back into Ephesians. Uh, somebody, um, actually, I, I'll start out. We, uh, we, we left off um, and finished the, the first 10 verses of Ephesians chapter 2. So if you want to flip there, we'll, we'll be uh, getting back to uh, Ephesians chapter 2. I found it interesting that Pastor Bill left off with Titus 2, 11 and 12. Uh, really perfect verses to, to provide that transition into the second half of this, this chapter when he's, he's talking about the grace of God appearing to all men. That is really what we're going to be discussing as we uh, move through um, the, the next uh, section or next three sections here, uh, actually. So we have, we've studied the, the first chapter and a half, essentially, of, of Paul's letter. Um, the key doctrines that he's outlined, we've gone through uh, redemption, reconciliation, election, predestination, grace, love, forgiveness, God's will and his purpose, the inheritance that we have in Christ, the Trinity, the promise of the Holy Spirit, uh, prayer, wisdom and knowledge, uh, God's power, his reign and salvation uh, by grace through faith. Um, and so we've we've taken a lot of time to pick apart those key doctrines and to try to, um, to understand the foundation on which this, this letter is, is being written. And now we're going to start to try to move a little faster and we'll see that Paul repeatedly comes back to those central doctrines and themes that we've outlined and that we've gone into that depth on. So hopefully that will help us as we, we move through, especially the next two and a half chapters of this letter to move faster and to have a, a firm understanding of, of what Paul has been, or what Paul is, is talking about. So if somebody would like to read, um, we're going to, over the next uh, three weeks, get through verses uh, 11 through 22 is my plan. Um, so you see that's quite a bit quicker than the spending several weeks on one verse. But if somebody would like to read verse 11 through the end of the chapter, I appreciate it. Brian. All right. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, that done in the body by the hands of men. Remember that at a time you were a, you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, a foreigner, in the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once were far away from uh far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two one, and has destroyed the barrier in dividing the wall of hostility, by abolishing in his flesh the law with his commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in him himself one new man out of two, thus making peace. And in one body and in this one body to reconcile both of them, God reconcile them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access to the Father by the Spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens of God, with God's people and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ and Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Thank you, Brian. So we see here as we, we begin the second half of the chapter, um, a, an important shift. Uh, and it's what uh, Klein Snodgrass in his commentary uh, calls perhaps the single most important ecclesio ecclesiological text in the New Testament. And so what we're seeing is a shift from the doctrine to um, a focus on the church. 
And we're going to see uh, here an explanation of, of the church, and then we're going to see in, in chapter three, and then in chapter four, we're going to see more relational um, aspects of, of Paul's writing. And we see here, as we, we start in verse 11, a, a parallel between the, the verses, uh, the first, ver the opening verses in chapter two and the second half. In verses one through three, the focus is on, is on how we were dead in Christ. And then verses 11 and 12, the focus is on how the Gentiles were excluded from the family of God. And then in verse 4, we see, but God, we saw that pivot, we spent a whole week talking just about the, the but God. And then um, in verse 13, we see a similar pivot where it's, it's but now. And so there is a parallel in how Paul is writing. He outlines that the first section, and then he's using that as the basis for his this second section. But the focus now is solely on um, the Gentile experience, so that how Gentiles are, are grafted into the, the family of God. And this is a huge part of what Paul is explaining. Remember, this is a circular letter that was sent to, to many churches. And so this is a, a huge part of what Paul was explaining to those, those churches. Both Jew and Gentile need to understand that the inclusion of Gentiles into the covenant of grace, into the family of God, is central to how God is building his church. Um, now, this is not a, a small point. This is not a, a small thing. Uh, Jews were God's chosen people, and they had immense um, pr uh, pride in, in that. Okay, And they, along with that, had... Um, serious contempt for, or hatred for, for the Gentiles. And that came from a, a number of different areas, from uh, religious, from ethnic or cultural, um, and, and, um, and, and racial as well. And so we see Paul, in, in very short order, address all of those issues. Um, he, he said that uh, the, for the, on the religious side, um, the Jews believed that Gentiles were, were created by God to be the fuel for the fires of hell. And they thought that God only, only loved Israel. Um, from the ethnic side, the Gentiles are basically non-Jews. So anyone who isn't Jewish by, by blood, the Greek word here in, um, in this passage is, is actually ethna. So refer, referring to non-Jewish ethnicities and, and Jews boasted of having a bloodline that was um, uh, from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay? And so we could go back to Hebrews 11, which Pastor Bill covered just a little bit ago, um, and, and see the significance of that. Um, but we also see the, the Jewish culture um, that they have pride in with the, the feasts and the ceremonies that distinguish them from, from peoples around them. So it's important to understand um, the distinctions there. The, the religious, the ethnic, and, and the cultural, and, and the deep-seated conflict that they would, would lead to, um, because that is going to be important when we talk relationally about peace between peoples as they become one body in, in Christ. Um, and, and the theme verse, really, for this passage is found right in the middle, um, which is verse 18. And so after he kind of out, Paul kind of outlines that, that stuff, he says, for through him, we both have access by one spirit to the Father. And that's really the verse that this all, all hinges on, is that we all have this access by one spirit to, to the Father. And so we're, we're going to, to talk over the next couple of weeks about the multiple purposes that God has and how this, this passage is, is written, um, but we're going to focus on the relationship with God, the relationship with, with other people, and, and specifically we'll be really looking at um, at peace. Now, it's important to note that Paul is writing primarily to Gentiles here. <clears throat> and so um, he's essentially saying that Gentiles need to be reminded of their, their past status, who they were, and be reminded of those, those distinctions. Not, not because they should feel lesser, not because they should feel excluded, but because those distinctions put in context all that God has done for them. Uh, when we, we understand what, what God has done for us, we, we can live with a better sense of gratitude to him and a better sense of love for, for one another. And it better enables us to live out the Christian life that we discussed when we were examining 
uh, Ephesians 2, 2 verses 10. And so we see here um, that, that Paul makes, makes several distinctions. In verse 11, he, he said that the Gentiles were uh, once Gentiles in, in the flesh. So he's talking about the, the actual, uh, the physical difference. He's saying religiously, he said they were without Christ. And then um, culturally, he said they were, they were foreigners. Um, or uh, Brian, I think you're reading NASB? NIV. NIV, when it said they were excluded from citizenship um, and, and hopeless without God. And so we see all those distinctions, the religious, the cultural, the ethnic, all kind of come together in, in two verses there in, in 11 and 12 and remind the Gentiles of, of who they were and, and kind of their, their exclusion from, from the covenant of, of God. And that helps us to, to put in context that then when he says, for through him we both have access by one spirit, Christ's perfect sacrifice. Okay, that he has made the sacrifice uh, once for all, and that, that Gentiles are now allowed access to God. Because that's the point that he's making in this passage. Gentiles, okay, those who were without Christ, who were foreigners, who were uh, hopeless, who were ethnically and culturally separate from God's people, are now given access. The gospel is not just for Jews. Christ's sacrifice is not just for Jews. Um, and God's people are not just the, the Israelites. And that's really the basis for, for God's church. That the church is made up uh, not just of those who have the blessings of God in the Old Testament, but all of those who, who have access to, to God's, um, God's blessings. Those who are aliens or foreigners or not citizens or, or strangers, however your version put it, um, are now uh, the full participants or recipients. And, and that's why, um, as Snodgrass said, it's such a pivotal passage in understanding the, the building of, of the church. And so let's take a look at exactly how that happened and how Paul explains it. Um, when he, he says um, that Christ's blood is the, is the sacrifice that was poured out and it breaks down the barrier, the wall of partition or, or the divide, depending on, on your version of the Bible. In, in verse 14, the King, New King James says, for he himself is our peace who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation. And that middle wall of separation there is kind of the pivotal point for explaining the, the Gentiles' access uh, to, uh, to God. That being broken is, is important. And so the, the Holy Temple in Jerusalem was the center of Jewish religious, religious life. It was, it was important. So let's turn to Hebrews chapter 9. Somebody would like to read the, the first 10 verses for us. You said nine. Hebrews 9, one verses 1 through 10. Through 10. Yep. Now, even the first covenant had regulations for worship in an earthly place of holiness. For a tent was prepared, the first section, in which were the lamp set, lampstand, and the table, and the bread of the presence. It is called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a second section called the most holy place, having the golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant covered on all sides with gold, in which was a golden urn holding the manna and Aaron's staff that budded and the tablets of the covenant. Above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot now speak in detail. These preparations having thus been made, the priests go regularly into the first section performing their ritual duties but into the second, only the high priest goes, and he but once a year, and not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the unintentional sins of the people. By this, the Holy Spirit indicates that the way into the holy places is not yet opened, as long as the first section is still standing, which is symbolic for the present age. According to this arrangement, gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect excuse me, perfect the conscious, conscience of the worshiper, but deal with, the, with only food and drink and various washings, regulations for the body imposed until the time of reformation. So we'll see the importance of the destruction of um, that wall of separation if we start out by looking at verse 8 here. The Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, 
while the first tabernacle was still standing. So there's a separation and access into the most holy place. And that's the place in the, the temple or the tabernacle where the, the earthly presence of God was. And, and so that access into that area to God's presence um, was not made manifest. It was not available yet as long as those distinctions or those separations were, were present. And so we see in this passage um, in, in Hebrews chapter 9, like Paul in Ephesians chapter 2, that the writer of Hebrews makes a <clears throat> distinction. He starts out this passage making a transition from the first covenant to the new covenant, or from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Um, from the, the earthly, he's comparing the heavenly, um, and we see in, in verse 3 that it says, behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle, which was called the holiest of all, or the most holy place. Okay, so there was a, a curtain, a, a separation between um, the, the holy place and the, and the most holy place that, that distinguished and separated people from, from the presence of God. It was a picture of, of sin separating man from God. Okay, and it was, um, it, it was an important distinction. Uh, 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 sorry, Eli read in uh, Matthew chapter 27 this morning. He was talking about um, uh, this very thing. And that, that distinction was um, a picture of, of God's grace, really, because it separated sinful man from, from God. Um, and, and it was a symbol of protection for man. And we were not exposed to the full wrath of God until, until Jesus paid the price on the cross and he took the wrath. We'll get to, to that in a second. Okay, but it was also a, a, a picture um, of the, the separation that our, our sin causes. As Isaiah said in Isaiah 59, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. So the, the veil, the curtain, is a picture of that separation. It is a, a distinction not allowing people into to the very presence of God. And there was uh, only once a year was the high priest allowed in. That's what the, the writer of Hebrews touches on in, in verse 7. Um, and, when, and when he says, um, but into the second part of the part, the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins committed in ignorance. There had to be that blood price paid even for the high priest to enter into the, the presence of God there. If you, if you go back to the establishment of this uh, in, in Exodus 30, it said that Aaron shall make atonement upon its horns, uh, speaking of the, the altar of incense, uh, once a year with the blood of the sin offering of atonement. Once a year he shall make atonement upon it throughout your generations. It is most holy to the Lord. And so within this most holy place was the, the presence of God, and, and it, the, the separation pointed toward the, the Messiah, pointed to the greater truth that someone was coming to pay the price to open up the, the access to, to God. And so what does that tell us about Gentiles? Because again, going back to um, Ephesians 2, verse 11, remember that you uh, once Gentiles in the flesh, Paul is addressing the Gentiles and telling them very specifically that there's something uh, important here. So the, the Jewish uh, temple had, had four courts, actually. Okay, they had the, the court of the Gentiles, the court of the women, the court of Israel, otherwise known as the court of men, and the court of, of the priests. And uh, the court of the, the Gentiles was referred to as, as the outer court. <coughs> we see in, in Revelation uh, 11. Let's actually turn there to Revelation 11. This will help us to understand the separation of the courts and um, the importance of the, the separations to the Gentiles. So we would like to read just verses one through three. Dan, go ahead. And there was given me a measure rod or a staff. And someone said, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar, and those who worship the given. And leave outer, and leave out the court which was outside the temple, and do not measure it, 
for it has been given to the nations, and they only tread underfoot the holy city forty two months. And I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy and they will prophesy for twelve hundred and sixty days, clothed in sackcloth. We see here the two witnesses in the, the beginning of the, the tribulation. And God gives them the instruction to, to measure the, the temple. And he tells them to leave out the outer court, to leave out the part where the Gentiles were previously allowed. Um, and so in verse two, it says, leave out the court, which is outside the temple and do not measure it for it has been given to the Gentiles and they will tread the holy city underfoot for 40, 42 months. And so we see the two witnesses here measuring the temple and, and noting the distinction be, between the, the courts. But we also um, hopefully will understand the meaning, which will hopefully become clear as we go, go through this. But there's no need to measure that outer court anymore. There's no need to measure because there's no separation. There's no distinction between specifically <coughs> Jew and Gentile. And because Jesus is giving Gentiles access into the actual temple and they're not excluded from the court anymore. Okay, so the, the, in the Old Testament, Gentiles and those who were ceremonially, ceremonially unclean, they were relegated to this, this outer court. Okay, they, could, they couldn't come into uh, the inner court where the sacrifices were made. The sacrifices that paid for, or were the symbol of what was being paid for their sin and, uh, and their transgressions. And the picture was that they were not actually a part of the, the people of God who had ex access to his blessings, his mercy, his forgiveness. Um, and, and passing over that separation was, um, that was a, a, a really big, big deal. Okay, it was punishable by death. We read in, in Acts chapter 21, uh, when Paul is arrested in the temple. Uh, let's actually turn there, because this is a, an interesting passage. Where was that? Acts, Acts <coughs> chapter 21. I'm going to start in verse 26. It says, and Paul took the men, and the next day, having been purified with them, entered the temple to announce the expiration of the days of purification, at which time an offering should be made for each one of them. Verse 27 is important. Now, when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man who teaches all men everywhere against the people, the law, in this place. And furthermore, he has brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. For they had previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesian, with him in the city, and they had supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. Mm -hmm. The people there accused Paul of bringing a Gentile into the temple, past that outer court, and into the area of the temple that, that the, the Gentiles were not allowed. And that was a, a huge deal. It says, all the city was disturbed, and the people ran together, seized Paul, and dragged him out of the temple, and immediately the doors were shut. Now, as they were seeking to kill him, news came of the, to the commander of the garrison that all Jerusalem was in an uproar. They're going to kill Paul for this. They're going to kill Paul. It was worth killing a, a Roman citizen because he, he brought Paul, a Jew, it was worth killing him because he brought a Gentile into uh, the, the temple past that, that outer court. He immediately took soldiers and centurions and ran to, down to them. And when they saw the commander and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Then the commander came near and took him and commanded him to be bound with two chains. And he asked who he was and what he had done. And some among the multitude cried one thing and some another. So when he could not ascertain the truth because of the tumult, tumult he con commanded them, I'm sorry, he commanded him to be taken into the barracks. When he reached the the stairs, he had to be carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the mob, for the multitude of people followed out, crying out away with him. So Paul, I mean, you can see the, the importance of, to, the, to the Jews, uh, the, uh, keeping the Gentiles out of, of the temple. Okay, they were going to, to, to kill Paul. He had to be saved um, by, by this Roman commander. And that's how critically important this distinction, this division was um, uh, among the, the, the Jews. Okay. And so that's that's the significance of 
of the veil, that, that separation. Okay. And when it was torn, and when we, we read about it being torn, and this is uh, something that is recorded in all three of the Synoptic Gospels. You know, I read this morning in Matthew 27. Uh, if you read the, the account of the crucifixion of, of uh, Christ being killed on, on the cross. And, and in verse 51, it says, Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked, and the rocks were split, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to men. So when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and the things that had happened, they feared greatly, saying, truly, this was the Son of God. And so we see now, we see the power of God splitting the veil, ripping it in two, tearing it from top to bottom. Okay? And, and that's that, that symbolism of opening up the most holy place, of opening up the, um, the, the, the temple. I think in Mark's gospel, I think it, it's recorded in um, a, a little more concisely. And, and I think the importance of it there is, is recorded really well. Let's turn to Mark chapter 15. Mark 15, I'll start in verse 37. And Jesus cried out with a loud voice and breathed his last. Then the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. So when the centurion who stood opposite him saw that, saw that he cried out like this and breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the son of God. So Mark gives a very succinct, is that three verses? Okay, uh, he's writing broadly to the church. Okay, he's often addressing Gentiles in, in uh, his writing who, who may not have been really familiar with, with Jewish customs. And yet he breezes right over this because it is such a central component to the Jewish culture that, that anyone in the area at that time would have understood the importance of the, the veil being torn. Okay, it was significant enough that, that everyone would have understood it. All three gospel accounts kind of breeze over this, and it's not because it's not an important aspect of the gospel. It's because everyone would have understood that this tearing, it was meant to show that God had done away with that, that separation and had provided access to himself through Jesus' death. And it's recorded in multiple places in, in Hebrews. Um, uh, Luke, Luke similarly just gives a four-verse account. We don't have time to, to go there, but the all three of the Synoptic Gospels very briefly and succinctly, very matter-of-factly show God tore the veil from top to bottom. It opened up this access to him. Um, and then let's turn to, um, to Hebrews chapter 10. You can go to Hebrews chapter 6. We could go elsewhere in Hebrews. Um, let's, let's finish up in, in Hebrews chapter 10. If you're looking for a parallel reading with, with the, the Gospels, Hebrews 6 is a, a great place to go. It talks about the, the flesh being torn and, and the, the symbolism of the, the flesh and the veil um, and, and Christ's sacrifice. It makes that connection in greater detail. Um, but, but for our purposes, let's, let's finish up in, in Hebrews chapter 10. If somebody wants to read uh, verses 19 through 25. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, open for us the curtain that is his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from the guilty conscience and having our bodies washed in pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he promised. Is faithful. Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up eating together as some are in the habit of food, but let us encourage one another and all, and all the more as you see the day approaching. So we see here in verses 19 through, through 22 
the, the significance of the veil being torn. See, the, the writer of Hebrews referenced there uh, the, the tearing of Jesus's flesh and the sim symbolism there. Um, but it says, therefore, brethren, having boldness, having confidence, I think Caleb's version said, uh, having confidence to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus. That's what the veil being torn does. It gives us confidence to go to God. We, we can now boldly and confidently go to, to God. It says, by a new and living way. Again, we see the distinction between the Old Testament, the New Testament, the Old Covenant, the New, new Covenant, however you want to phrase that, which is consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. We've studied how Jesus is our high priest. We've looked at that in, in pretty uh, good detail as we went through Ephesians chapter 1. Interesting to note that um, in, in verse 23, again, we see a pivot there. It says that let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. We see the practical application. We see the spiritual reality that we now have confidence to go to God. And then we see the practical application that we should live out our lives, like Ephesians 2.10 told us, uh, consistent with that profession of, of faith. This is directly followed by a section entitled The Just Live by Faith. Again, interesting to see that connection to, to Ephesians chapter 2 that we were studying just a couple of, of weeks uh, ago. Next week, I think we're doing commissioning. And then two weeks from now, we'll kind of start in verse 14. We won't obviously spend as much time there, but we'll see the transition where uh, we're going to start talking about peace. Peace with God, peace with other believers. We'll spend some time in, in Romans chapter 5. Um, and we'll see that in Christ, the Jew and the Gentile are, are made one. That Paul is celebrating this, uh, this union of Jew and Gentile as one in the, in the body of, of Christ. Um, and we'll see, start to see this relational component of the theological truths. In verses 14 through 18, we'll talk about the peace that believers have with God and with each other. Verses 19 through 22, we'll talk about Christ being the cornerstone of the, the foundation of the church. And we'll start talking about the, the church. Chapter 3 is all about God's church. And that's why um, he says it's an ecclesiastical passage. It's about the building of God's church. And then chapter four is all about the unity of, of the body of Christ. So we've, we've come through the section talking about our sin, talking about our depravity, talking about all that stuff. And now we get to talk about how we are all made, made one and uh, in, in Christ. So that's where we're, we'll pick up in a couple of weeks. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we praise you. Lord, we know that none of us are worthy to come to you. Uh, we know that uh, none of us have earned the right to be called your sons and daughters, uh, your children. And we just praise you, Lord, that you've you've made a way through through Jesus. That you've um, made us all a member of your your body. And, and we pray, Lord, that as we study these things, that we would be encouraged to share your word with others, to to share the gospel, to invite others in, uh, and to experience your love, your forgiveness, your grace, and and have access into your presence that you've you've opened to us through Jesus. We praise you, Lord, for all that you've done, and pray that as we study your word, we would understand it better so that we can share it better with others and live our lives as a testimony for you. We thank you and we praise you in Christ's name.